Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is David Shane. I am the Director of Program Services for the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York, uh, more commonly known as Art New York. And we want to welcome everyone who is watching this live stream or watching the recording of this live stream um, in the future. Um, thanks for being here to be a part of this conversation. Before we begin, we'd like to take the time to acknowledge that wherever we are currently located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. I want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. We also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people. And we want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. Thank you very much. So we are here today to have a conversation um, about pay equity with some folks um, from around uh, the country uh, and in, with many different roles in the field. So I'd like to uh, begin by asking them to introduce themselves. Um, and if you would, uh, folks, I will, in, I will model um, our introductions by asking that you share your name, your pronouns, uh, your title and your role in the field, and that may be, there may be multiple roles that you play, feel free to share the, uh, the totality of that. Let us know where you are uh, located currently, and then if you would offer a brief visual description. So again, my name is David Shane. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am the Director of Program Services uh, at Art New York. I'm also a freelance director out in the world. Uh, I am calling to you from Lenape land um, in Upper Manhattan. And I am a white man in my early 40s. I have light brown hair, a short brown beard, and I'm wearing a, a yellow floral shirt sitting in my living room in front of some teal walls with some art. And I will attempt to move. Uh, let's do uh, alphabetically. So <laughs> Bredine, you would be our first uh, panelist up. Hello, thank you. My name is Bredine Cotton. Um, I use she, her pronouns. My background is stage management and arts management, and I'm an educator now based in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Um, I'm instructor of stage management and project management for New York University Abu Dhabi. Um, I'm coming to you from my nook here in Abu Dhabi. So I am a, a 30 some early 30s white woman with short dark brown hair. Um, in a colorful room and a gray and colorful top. I think that's everything. Yes, thank you. Elsa. Sorry, I wasn't ready. Um, I'm Elsa Hiltner, she, her. Um, I'm gonna be 40 this week. I'm a white woman, straight, cisgender, uh, able-bodied. I'm also a parent. All these things uh, impact pay inequity. Um, and um, I'm coming from Chicago. I'm a co-founder and current board president of Honor Team. And I'm also program director at Lawyers for the Creative Arts. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Daniel? Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Daniel Park. You can use he and him pronouns for me today. I am a mixed race Korean and Polish person with a short beard, glasses, and a unicorn tail colored undercut sitting on a pink gamer chair in my bedroom, uh, calling in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape people. Uh, I am a founding worker owner with Obvious Agency. We're one of the country's uh, maybe only, maybe few of the only, uh, it's sort of hard to say, um, worker-owned cooperatives uh, in the theatrical and performance sector. Uh, and there I am the cooperative business manager. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie Robin. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a lighting designer by craft and a labor organizer for United Scenic Artists, IATSE Local USA 829. Um, I am the co-author with Bradine of a new book 
um, called Theater Work, which looks at um, production labor practices. I am based and zooming to you from, oh, look, there's a copy of the book. <laughs> I'm based and zooming to you from uh, Philadelphia, not far from Daniel, also the land of the Lenape people known as Lenape, as, uh, Lenape Hoking. Um, I am a white woman with red glasses and a blue denim dress. Um, my hair is brown and um, acid green. And behind me, there's a white wall with a bunch of art and some bookshelves. Thank you. And Natalie, since uh, we finished with you and you've, you've teed it up, let's start by talking about the book. If you would please um, tell us the title of this book, um, if either you and or Breeding wanted to give us a little bit of a summary about what we might find in that book, and then tell us what led you to wanting to write it. This is a, you know, a book about um, theater work, and we're here to have a conversation about pay in theater. So um, why don't you kick us off? Great. That's um, exactly perfect. I will talk about the book, and then Breeding will, Bredi will talk about where the book came from. Um, so the book is called Theater Work, Reimagining the Labor of Theatrical Production. Um, it just was released by Rutledge last week. Uh, it we The book is divided into three parts. Um, uh, the first part looks at um, the scope of the project and then past uh, issues of representation, um, mostly related to race and gender, um, working practices that shift and the shift of what we refer to as the pause, which is, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdown, and the 18 months of no theater, um, as well as our own research. Um, and then we talk about uh, current production practices um, that we've seen across the industry that affects production workers. To be clear, when we're talking about production workers, we're talking about backstage workers um, in all crafts, designers, um, we are not talking about directors, choreographers, dramaturgs, performers, or, um, or theater management, uh, administration, et cetera. Uh, and then the, the third section of the book is called Imaginings, and it um, is focused on looking at what questions we as a field, um, we as individuals, we as producers, we as theater makers, we as workers should be asking as we move forward if we want to make things better. <laughs> yes, thank you, Natalie. So um, the book sort of initially stemmed from um, some research that I was doing in my graduate program studying public policy. Um, so I chose to study public administration with a focus on management and leadership of nonprofits and public service organizations, um, really with the hopes of thinking about arts organizations and how we facilitate creative processes. and. I found myself um, first really studying and researching unpaid internships and the barriers that the culture around internships creates and publishing an op-ed with HowlRound and then um, doing more research about um, accessibility within higher ed programs for theater and then focusing in on gender equity within theatrical design positions. And the more I sort of followed these different research threads, the more they all felt so related to one another. And it just kept feeling like we can't be thinking about gender and not thinking about race. And we can't be thinking about hiring practices and not thinking about education and all of these things just about like we needed to be sort of researching and thinking about the worker, the life of a worker all related to one another. So that's sort of the early, um, some of the early thinking that led to this book. And then I began collaborating with Natalie, who as well as being a lighting designer and educator is now a labor organizer, which felt like a really important perspective. Um, and we have a history of working together. Anything else on that, Natalie? Do you yeah, well, I think um, you know it was important for us that the work look at look at the microcosm that we're talking about, but also be thinking about how this affects workers in adjacent fields and also workers in fields where they're asking similar questions, even if they don't seem adjacent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brady. Well, and just one other thing that I think led us to it was the lack of academic research and writing that there is about this field and particularly production positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, there are many, many things in what you said that I want to dig into, <laughs> but I want to make sure that our, our viewers have a sense of who all is in the room. So I'm going to um, move next to Elsa um, to give us a little bit of an introduction about on our team, um, its mission and its goals and how it came to be. Yeah, so Honor Team was founded in January of 2020 by um, a group of uh, mostly costume designers, costume workers who are experiencing pay inequity firsthand. I have a background as a costume designer. That was most of my career. Um, and the goal is really the, the whole organization is centered around building pay equity in theater and in the arts industry writ large. And uh, we do that in several different ways. A lot of advocacy work, um, talking to workers, you know, talking to organizations, pointing out, you know, the system that we're currently in, what the landscape is like and um, education around what is pay equity, what does that mean, what are gender and racial pay gaps, um, and then creating tools and giving folks access to those free tools that either workers can use or organizations can use, like the pay equity standards, which is uh, kind of an organic fair trade food label for arts organizations who are creating equitably made and paid art. Incredible. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, for sure. But Daniel, um, would you tell us a little bit about the obvious agency, which I'm, I think I'm going to say this correctly, is, as you describe it, a worker-owned cooperative. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, Can you tell so, us what that means? Yeah. So um, a worker-owned cooperative, at sort of its simplest, is simply a business where the people who work there are also the people who own the business. Um, we can dive more into that. And there are also many, many different forms of cooperatives. Um, obvious agency itself, we've been around since about 2016. Um, and, uh, you know, we started in a way that I think like most arts, you know, ensembles, small companies do. We were just a bunch of artists who did a project together. We had an opportunity and then we said, we want to keep doing this. Um, but, you know, like particularly in that time, we were all in our like early to mid 20s. And it was this moment where there was a lot of reaction against the nonprofit model. Adrian Mackey and some other folks were like, putting out this really clear advice of like, do not start a nonprofit. If anything, and you really need that structure, move to fiscal sponsorship. Um, and we had also a lot of us come out of, you know, the like unpaid, under-resourced, hyper-extractive internships and fellowships that a lot of theaters um, were sort of putting out there as kind of the pathway for young artists and uh, young arts workers at the time. So we were really just interested when we started in this question of like, um, how can we build power and wealth for artists and arts workers? What is an alternative to the philanthropic system for funding artwork? Um, and how do we just give artists more say in, in the work and their working conditions itself? And so we kind of do a few different things as obvious agency. One is we produce the artistic work of our ensemble members, same as any other theater company, with kind of no expectation that that work will necessarily ultimately be profitable in the end, because under capitalism, it's really hard for art to be profitable, right? Um, but then uh, at, we also, as part of a sort of our initial founding, um, because of how we got started, which was a commission project for a local university, we were like, maybe there's some money in this. Maybe there are ways that we can leverage our skills as um, theater makers, as artists, to actually provide some like market ready skills to other arts and culture organizations. So part of what we do is create participatory programming for museums, for libraries, for other organizations and businesses to, to help them um, create more relevant and engaging work. And then much more recently, as interest in the solidarity economy has grown and as interest around democratic management has grown, we've also started sharing our wisdom through consulting work and workshops and things like that. Um, um, around how we do those practices uh, and the knowledge that we've that we've acquired over time. Thank you. Um, so I think it's kind of essential uh, that if we're going to have a conversation about pay equity, that we define that for ourselves in some way. So you know, one of the things that I think about is sort of the different ways in which we are measuring whether whether or not pay is equitable. There are sort of the like, role to role within the field? Is, are those things equitable to each other? There is the, is it equitable as compared to or based on an organization's budget size? Um, is it equitable based on any identifying factors like race or gender? Um, those are a few, there are probably others. I would just love to hear from you, like when you are thinking about pay equity, 
what do you mean? What, what, how do you define that? And anyone can jump in and answer this. I mean, pay equity is compensating worker roles without bias. And it's really important to look at the whole organization and not these kind of like siloed departments, which I think is really common and easy to do now. We might pay you know, managers in the marketing department, this amount, but managers in a design department, a completely different amount. And it, sometimes it's even different um, scales and ways of payment, you know, flat fees versus hourly versus salary. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I think is important is it's completely fine to come together with a group of people and make art just for the passion of making art and nobody is making financial benefit or gain from it. Um, and you can have, you know, a form of equity and pay equity in that system too. Um, but if people are making money, it needs to be equitable. You need to look at the system and, um, and, and have a kind of collaborative open system that allows people to, you know, point things out that maybe you didn't see from your vantage point over here and your identity over here. Um, as far as like all the different types of work that it takes to make theater, it's hard to know the whole system in just one person. Yeah, that's great perspective. Natalie, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to offer that um, one of the folks who we interviewed in the book, um, Beth Lake, who's a sound designer and associate sound designer on Broadway, um, uh, talks about equity as um, giving everyone what they need. Um, and I think, and we talk a lot about how this is an important part of this conversation, which is that it's not it's not as easy and is perhaps the reason why the Equal Pay Act is so ineffectual, which is like just saying a title and a dollar amount doesn't take into account um, the nuances of the labor that's being done, the specific needs of the human who's doing them, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, I think there's a reason we don't call it pay equality, right? <laughs> um, and I just wanted to lift that up. Yeah, this is so related to something I want to ask Daniel about. So I'm going to kick it to you next. Uh, Daniel co-wrote an article for HowlRound. I encourage you to look it up. Um, but in that, he... I think the phrase you said was something about um, your work with the obvious agency to move away from the scarcity and abundance binary to a discussion around what is enough. And that feels really related to what Natalie is talking about. I wonder if you want to expand on that. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, man. OK, so I, th I mean, I think in terms of that quote, like the best place that to start in talking about that, right, is obvious agency historically, and even still, even with some of the more recent grants that we've gotten, because we've really only started um, receiving external support for our work uh, financially pretty recently. The way that we started was when it came down to money for these like gigs that we were doing ridiculously underpaid is, right, I think coming from a like democratic values place, even if we weren't calling it that at the time, which is like relying on the culture that we had built together and the relationships that we had in order to have just like transparent, real conversations with one another um, to talk about like, okay, well, we don't have enough money to pay all of us. So how should this money be moving, right? And also thinking about like, we're trying to invest in this company into the future. So how do we take this like fourth entity into account? So the way that we did that was we just sat down and we talked about our individual lives, where we were at with the jobs that we had, with the money that we had, um, histor our history historical access to like capital through our families because of our identities, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we just said, okay, cool. Like how, how can we divide up this resource in a way that makes it possible for all of us to like participate in this work to like the fullest extent that we're capable uh, of. And it's why like those systems that we're talking about, right? The like legal systems make some of this difficult because it puts this really like narrow view on this idea of what equity is. So like the result of that first time we had that conversation, my two collaborators, the other founding worker owners, Ariana Gass and uh, Joseph Ahmed, they both had like jobs at the time financially they were doing okay um i was freelancing like fully for the first time and i had no idea where my rent was going to come from for the next month and we were doing a gig for like something like fifteen hundred dollars it was like way less than what we should have been um and so they said we want to put all of our money back into the company we don't need this little bit right now and we want you to take your rent so that you know where where that's coming from and you're feeling secure and you're able to like mentally show up for this work right and that was this like first moment where i 
felt like I really experienced what solidarity meant. And it's interesting because now that we do have more money, we're having to create these much more formal policies and systems for what pay equity actually means to us. But we're also really getting into the depths of like, with where we are right now at the size that we're at, for instance, one of the big questions that Ari was just leading us through was this question of should managerial and like director level even sort of responsibilities be compensated at a different rate from like assistant level? And at first it was interesting. I was at this place of like, yeah, absolutely a hundred percent, right? Like if it's coming to me to like have to make all of these critical decisions to ultimately be the one at the end of the day who is responsible for the outcome of the success of the work, like that's really different different to me than somebody having to like go to drive to pick up some supplies and just kind of be told what to do, right? But then on the other side of that, and um, Kat Ramirez, our fourth worker owner who came in a few years ago, what, what they brought in was like at the size that we're at now and likely for the next year or so, we're all doing all of it. There is kind of no distinction and actually all of that work is fully critical right now and there really isn't much of a distinction between it we need all of that right so it's this weird place where like this conversation around equity is so incredibly contextual it does really require articulation transparency conversation and real systems to make sure that you're being equitable about it but like what it means that definition is like really going to change context to context yeah, I just see in incredible amounts of uh, vigorous nodding <laughs> happening in the room. So I'll just sort of open it up. Um, anybody who wants to jump in and, and respond to that, please feel free. I'll jump, I'll jump in, I think, on one thread from Daniel and then on one thread about the, quest the defining question. I think that that question that you just raised is so interesting about the management position and it's one that I think about a lot, particularly in academia, but also in theater of, like, you, I mean, just, I think, echoing and adding to what you were saying, that each of these positions are so vital, and being really, really great at a skill does not necessarily mean that you need to be managing people that do that thing, and that the, we could be valuing those roles equally or equitably. equitably. Um, but the other and the other thing I just wanted to share is one of the definitions that Natalie and I use in the book for pay equity, which is um, when the compensation reflects the combination of the work being done and the experience needed to do the work within the employer's budget. Um, and noting that pay transparency goes hand in hand with pay equity, which I think is another piece of what Daniel was touching on. Yeah, there's something. Uh... A lighting designer that we recently had a conversation with at Art New York illuminated, now I'm using lighting puns, um, <laughs> illuminated a really um, like interesting and troubling sort of development, which is in an effort to compensate electricians at a more equitable rate, which this lighting designer fully supports and wants to see happen, right? They want there to be like skilled labor that's well compensated in that in an effort for organizations to meet that need they are they're now experiencing a world where they're going on to projects as a designer and if they break out their fee to an hourly rate they're making much less hourly than the crew that is working with them and they're and they're sort of like i don't want them to be making any less money i also understand that organizations have limited budgets and i'm not trying to to like you know inflate my own fee i'm just trying to find a balance in there that is that can support everyone and and trying to figure out what that you know and and deal with that tension um, and I think that that is an example, but not the only example of the type of um, sort of place we are where we have to think, as so many of you have said, about, about all of the different ways we need to think about this and how they impact each other. Natalie, I if think I you can, want Yeah, I want to jump in. I mean, I, A, the thing you're saying is a long time, it's not a new problem, it is a long time problem. Um, because in part, one of the wild inequities that exists is that some theater workers are paid on a fee-based model in which they are misclassified as independent contractors um, and some are paid on an hourly basis. So in in it is basically impossible for someone who is working on a fee-based model, which includes most designers, most directors, um, uh, 
to make more than, or to make even as much as someone who is being paid hourly. And that's because largely, um, I mean, there's a million historical reasons why this is true, but largely it is about um, this bifurcation between art making and work. Um, so I'll take a moment to say like, this is when we should talk about how artists are also workers and we sell our art as labor. <laughs> this is like my real soapbox. Um, because when we are allowed to think our work is less valuable because it is more artistic, we are just paid less. Um, and, and then when you get into like the pay inequities, which exist around ge historically gendered work, which is why on our team was founded mostly by costume designers and work workers in the costume, um, crafts, uh, we that perpetuates even more that there's um even more unseen work and even more expectation around the work that quote unquote artists are expected to produce as part of their art which is separate and weirdly lesser valued than the um often physical labor of the folks who um make things or hang things or build things or whatever yeah. Um, Elsa, please pick up from there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot you can say to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I when you were talking about, you know, who's being paid less, who's being paid more, you know, I think it's really easy to, you know, say, why are you paying somebody else more? And really it needs to be flipped. Why are you paying somebody else less? You know, we always want people to, you know, make what they need to make. Um, but the, the question should always be, you know, why is it okay to have a sub-minimum wage when it's broken out hourly or, um, you know, have unpaid internships or these sorts of things? Um, so I think flipping that question is uh, an important part to solving the issue. And um, just to also pick up on the pay transparency piece, um, I think we've done a lot of work in the theater industry to have better pay transparency. I think, um, you know, definitely coming up, I felt the need to look successful and uh, present like I was making large fees. I don't know why, but that was kind of the the scene that I felt in Chicago, at least. Um, when in reality, you know, everybody's making like twenty five to thirty two thousand dollars a year as a designer. You know, if you're if you're having a good year. Um, and um, that pay transparency is really important because it allows us to see the system and see what other folks are making and what other folks are not making and both like to advocate for ourselves, but then also for um, other people. So super important within organizations, on job posts um, and, you know, sharing budgets and all that, too. Some of the stuff like I want to jump in here uh, has so many things, but like part of what's coming up right is y'all are pointing to like the cultures and systems that we are living in and also like Natalie jumping on your boat like I want to get on my soapbox for a second right which is just like none of this would be an issue if we had a universal basic income right this conversation would be moot if that was a thing so like just as I continue to push us all in that direction right but like the government is who is defining how money can move right funders are the ones defining what like primarily right for the audience that we're talking to today right funders are, are the ones who are defining how much money there even is to move right controlling what room we have for pay equity right management staff are oftentimes the ones defining how what are oftentimes not enough resources are being allocated to organizations and then workers are ultimately the ones right and there's some overlap here of course right workers are simply deciding if they can consent or if they can afford to say no to the offers that they're being presented to them in order to do the like avocation that they feel called to right um and i wanted to offer just really quickly like some of the practices obvious agency as like a smaller organization does to like overcome some of these hurdles or to do some power sharing around this stuff. So for instance, right, a lot of what y'all are talking about is um, all of that individualized labor that when we're working for flat fees gets like erased in that conversation. That was a big thing for us immediately, like coming in as performers who we were like, we're not getting paid for me memorizing our lines. Like that's not part of what's built into the hourly of our contract. So we actually have, uh, oftentimes we try to prioritize when possible hourly wages for artistic staff, which means more work for 
tracking those hours and submitting invoices, but it also means getting paid more usually. Um, we also like invite our contract staff into democratic practice with us, like defining budgets for our projects and having an actual say in their own contract terms. Like we're willing to share that power with them and to be like, hey, we have to make a hard choice between like paying people or like the design budget that we want. Can you like, let's work together to figure out how we make this hard decision together, right? Um, open bookkeeping practices with all of our staff, letting everybody know how much money there is and where that money is going and like walking them through that, not just waiting till they come to ask us about that information. And then also right towards uh, the last thing that y'all are talking about, just setting limits on pay disparity within the organization, saying nobody should be making two more, like more than two times what the lowest paid, you know, person on staff is getting paid. Um, there are so many practices out there. And Natalie, like with your background in union organizing and the way that you were introducing the book, the other thing that I think is really important, right, is not just like, not just that this work can be a fractal for other fields, but that actually other fields and sectors have done so much more work around these questions already. And we're not, I feel like I want us to do more as a culture to like reach out to learn from them and actually like uh, internalize some of that stuff. We get so weird about money. Yeah, I think that that you know so much of what you're talking about, Daniel. I would I would refer to as budget transparency, and I don't just mean just the budget, but also the sort of like nuances of that. And the amount of times I've had conversations, I think most frequently with designers, around like that that particular question of like, oh, I didn't realize this was the amount of money that we had to work with and it had been allocated in this way. If I had known that, if I had been sh that information had been shared with me, I could have made different design decisions that might have supported this budget in a better, fuller way. Um, and that, 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 that actually like, we're not protecting, I don't know who we think we're protecting, right? <laughs> By like not sharing the information. Um, we could be sharing the information more fully would actually lead everyone to make like fuller, more transparent, more interesting artistic decisions. Well, we're protecting the power structure. Sure. I mean, there are many, many instances of designers, especially re recently, who have asked explicitly to reallocate production, like um, the budget for stuff to people and have been refused that request. So I just want to name that, like, there's a very clear thing that's being protected, which is, um, uh, the the power structure and this idea that you can only make theater by spending a lot of money on stuff and not that you can make excellent theater by spending a lot of money on people and less money on stuff. Like we all have our jobs because we are incredibly creative, smart humans. And we've all seen amazing work that has been made with almost no money. But there is a real, and this is a conversation that is happening. Um, I mean, we talk about this in the book, but also I will just say in my work, in, um, in my union work, like this conversation around what designers are getting paid in relationship to the budget of the things they are designing is astronomical. Mm. A designer who's getting paid, and this is real math, $3,500 to design a show with a $70,000 set, like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I think the pay equity question is also about like, um, what is the the relationship between um, stuff and humans and product. Mm. I'll just add to what Natalie said in terms of you said we're protecting the power structure, but like what you just got at at the end, we're also protecting the product or what we, and what somebody believes needs to be the product. I think too, it's, you know, uh, beyond you know yes protecting the power structure but it's also really scary to change a structure as an organizational leader and say you know what we've been doing it x way for a while we're going to do it y way this time and um you know start paying people more there's a commitment right that as soon as you pay people more you have to keep paying people more because now they know you can do that and you know it uh i think there's a fear of that not being able to go back and a fear of, you know, um, this, you know, is it worth it to pay fewer people a living wage or a thriving wage, even if it means you're not hiring as many artists as before? And also, I mean, the whole funding sphere as far as how many artists did this grant go to support, you know, these metrics that are, you know, uh, put upon us. Um, 
And so I think there's um, also people who actually want to be doing good change, but it's uh, scary to start. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to do it in a way that doesn't kind of like dig up past uh, harms that they've done in a way that they have to acknowledge and might be publicly acknowledged too. Um, and that can be, you know, a, a thing you got to move past on a personal level and an organization level too. Well, I, oh man, I have so many thoughts about this too, because um, a big thing that I've been thinking about around the arts economy generally recently is like, is, is broadly right solidarity. Part of what's been really interesting is as we start to talk more and more publicly and teach more publicly about um, democratic management, one of the benefits I see of that work is that for organizational leaders, even with organizations where there is still like on the day to day sort of a more traditional hierarchy, one of the benefits about sharing power is that you're also sharing the responsibility and accountability for making those hard decisions. It doesn't fall onto the shoulders of just one single person to make that call and then to be the one to receive all of the feedback, positive and negative when we see okay well how did this experiment actually work right and i always it's always really challenging right to balance because again talking about power there are ways in which for instance the artistic director of a theater company holds a lot of power there's also ways in which they have very little power right i think when we're talking about money it's also important to recognize like when i for instance talk about philanthropy there's this interesting conflation right sometimes we think about philanthropy and we think about who are our program officers well they're the face of those organizations they're not actually the people that ultimately hold the power right that's the owning class that is the boards of those foundations the families from whom that money flows the wealth right um and there are nuances within all of that. So I just, um, I bring that up to say, I've been thinking a lot and I have a lot of questions around like, I think building real solidarity between all of these different stakeholders within the arts economy, right? To come together more transparently, to be making more decisions communally together, right? Even if we still hold on to some remnants of those hierarchies when they're helpful, when they're appropriate, can help us get over some of those like cultural and emotional challenges that get in the way of this stuff and so that we can build towards something that ultimately will be better and will serve all of us not to say that it's easy right but like at the very least when we're all involved in making the hard decision we can only look around at the circle to one another to be like okay this is how it went out let's talk it went down like let's talk about it let's check in yeah thank you one example of i think a shift we've seen, and it's not universal, but we have seen a shift in the amount of unpaid or underpaid internships in the field. That conversation sort of bubbled and, and there was a response to that. And I feel like I've had conversations with many organizations for whom that was a traditional part of their model and it isn't any longer. That's not true for everyone, but we have seen that shift. And I wonder, we've also seen that there are varying degrees of impact to that shift. There are certainly people who are now making money that they wouldn't have made. There are also just positions, internships, and, and ways to enter the field that no longer exist. And that has an impact too. Um, and I wonder if anybody wants to speak to like your observation, whether it was through uh, the research for the book or at, uh, conversations that you've had around that shift and its impact and how that is uh, sort of related to this whole conversation. I mean, uh, oh, now we okay. Um, I think uh, Lift the Curtain did fantastic uh, advocacy and activism work that really brought a lot of that around. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there are a lot of unpaid internships that are now called fellowships or some other term, which is kind of uh, odd to see. Um, but I think that it's really, you know, I I understand the people who are like, you know, there's you know fewer opportunities, less place to engage, you know, start out, but. Um, talent is so much more common than opportunity. And if we're only giving these opportunities to a certain type of person, you know, uh, people with family wealth, um, you know, no college loans, uh, breadwinning partner, you know, um, all those lines of privilege, uh, we're going to get a theater industry that looks like it does now, which is predominantly white and predominantly uh, has, you know, is really funded and supported by generational wealth. 
And um, we're making a choice between that and something that's more democratic, more representative of the entire you know, spectrum of people that live in our country or our region. Um, and that's, you know, not a bad choice to make, but there is a choice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not, it, it is also true for conversations like this that, and, and, I, and I'm not speaking for anybody particular in this room because I don't know all of the, the, the like particulars of your lived experience, but like, Oftentimes the people who have the resources and ability to have these conversations, which are unpaid, right? Like, like we're compensating you to be here, but, but to have, to do the work that you've done to get here, much of that is uncompensated labor. And not everybody has the privilege to be able to engage in that uncompensated labor to even advance their view in, in the field and, and their perspective. Um, that's, you know, I'm just acknowledging that as part of this as well. I mean, it's part yeah. of, to me, oh, sorry, uh, Brittany, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'll begin and pass it over to you. Um, well, I mean, one on that note, David, that's something that we thought a lot about with the book of that balance of should we use our privilege and resources to be doing this research um, and trying to navigate that with with care and respect. But to, I think Elsa, that, that point about fellowships, I think is really important in that we're still really in the middle of this shift away from unpaid internships like I think that we're still we're not yet seeing what is we're not yet seeing a functional professional training model we're still in the middle of seeing fewer or unpaid internships but not yet how does this actually work I think I hope in five or ten years that we see how it can work but I don't know that we are there yet I think um Right now with hiring practices, we're still seeing an expectation of work experience. So there's still this sort of, I think, disconnect between education and hiring, which I see a lot, particularly working with students um, in terms of how they get those first jobs. So I feel like we're still organizations and people with, particularly people with hiring power are still really in this place of figuring out, in addition to the elimination of unpaid internships, what does that then mean for how professional training works. And I think, I know Daniel's next, but I do wanna just name that we should probably be talking about both unpaid and underpaid internships because I live and work in Pennsylvania where minimum wage is 725 an hour and a thriving wage in Philadelphia is 1850 to 1950 an hour. So even an intern who's making minimum wage cannot likely live on that. And so, I think it's important to name like, yes, David, we are seeing that shift, but in a lot of cases, we're seeing the shift to a, what is sort of like nominally not unpaid, but is still not livable. Um, and so still has all those barriers, but I will pass it to Daniel. Yeah, well, oh man, I, you're all so smart. So a lot of what I was gonna say, I'm like, oh, it's gone already. But the things that are coming up for me now are just um, the, the, approach for this work is so complicated and I think it's part of what makes the interpersonal work really hard which is that we are living in a world where right regardless of who is in control of our government we're seeing a rise in fascism day-to-day <laughs> -day survival is getting harder and harder for everybody right now oh thank you um, yeah, day-to-day -day survival is getting harder and harder for everybody right now so there is an urgency to this work right? We actually need to figure this out because people's survival is on the line in so many different ways. And it's also not a problem that's going to get solved in like probably the next 50 years, right? We need to be thinking generationally about how do we address this? And they're not issues like we've already said that are unique to our field necessarily either. So for me, it brings me back to like this question of how do we as like arts workers right how do we build solidarity with other workers to actually really shift the fundamental system of economics within our country right yes there are particulars about this that are unique to the arts but it's not all of it right and so like that's the thing because i i, I take in the mindset of like the artistic director or the managing director who's like yeah i agree with all of this but i don't know what to do right now right like what do i do right now and I don't want to alleviate the urgency of that question, but I also want to widen 
the like what participation and answering this can look like for us as individuals and for our organizations to be like do what you can right now right figure out where and how you slot in but also be thinking how do you fix this for two generations from now three generations from now so that we're in a better place eventually as opposed to constantly being on the defensive doing harm reduction work i would love to just dig into that a little bit more because i know you know, I, I facilitate conversations like this on a regular basis. And I know there are people watching who have that very real question of like, what I'm here watching, I'm here engaging in this. I want to do something. What do I do right now? And I know that the answer to that is really individualized, but I would love to open up to hear from any of you around some like, do you have thoughts around where to start, where to look at first, what to prioritize, again, knowing that you can't speak to anyone's uh, specific situation, but what does that bring up for you? What do people do now? You know, I think the question that Bree named a couple minutes ago about thinking about product um, is really important. You know, some of the work that we're seeing that some of the folks who are really leading this conversation are having the hard conversation. And Elsa mentioned this too about like, do we do fewer shows and pay people better to do them? Like, maybe that's okay. Maybe, yes, maybe in a given season, that means fewer jobs. But if no one's getting paid a living wage, then like, who cares that you've hired a lot of people? Like, no offense, but that's not really helpful. Um, and I think also that there's questions around like, I'm sorry, no one's going to like this. If you can't afford to pay your workers, how are you in business? And the American not-for-profit model that says, it's okay, we're paying you in like satisfaction and passion, like my landlord does not care. And so like, if you can't afford to pay people, you need to really look at why you're making, why you're having it, why you have a business at all. And I think some of what you're saying here needs to be amplified to funders. And I, Art New York is a funder, right? We're and and we're by no means the sort of thing that's going to fix <laughs> this, right? But but I think we can we should amplify as we're doing today this idea around like some people are going to make a decision to do less work. That also means they're going to make less in earned revenue because they're going to sell less tickets. Okay, somebody's going to have to fill that gap. And if you, as a as a funder, whether we're talking about an individual or more than likely a foundation or a government entity who is funding the arts, if you want there to be a diversity of artistic experiences for your community, then you have to fill that gap because they're going to have to make those difficult decisions and they're going to lose income as a part of it. And so that we have to step in there because I do think that is that is one possibility, but it does need support. And so I'm just sort of trying to amplify the support that would be required for what Natalie just suggested. Um, I, can, can I jump in? Because on our team and I have been working with funders to facilitate those conversations, start those conversations. Um, and in particular, like make sure that foundations or, you know, make sure it might not be the word, encourage foundations to fund organizations who are doing this work, whether or not doing pay equity work means they have the perfect system that works perfectly for what they want to do right now, or if they're moving that direction and there is constant, you know, change and update as far as how that goes. Um, but adding questions about, you know, wh where is the money going when they get a grant, right? Are there unpaid internships? Is there a big disparity between the highest paid and the lowest paid, you know, hourly equivalent worker, those sorts of things so that we can start to use both, you know, arts organizations care what foundations ask in their grant reports. And so that's kind of a motivator right there. But also, you know, um, people should think about where their money is going and um, we should encourage it to go to more equitable funding models. Um, and then the pay equity standards, another big uh motivation for creating that was having that label that folks who were donating or buying tickets could see, you know, I try to buy organic food as much as I can because I want to support farm workers who don't have to work in pesticides, those sorts of things. Um, and so if we can start to engage not just funders, but ticket buyers and board members and the, you know, general public in art as work, artistic labor, what it takes to create art. Um, so that they're making those decisions uh, as far as like what groups they want to support too. 
I'll offer real quick that like so one piece of advice is is as much as I hate to say like I think the solidarity thing is still important is important and all signs right now are pointing to particularly the national arts funding landscape I can't speak necessarily to local the national arts funding landscape probably starting next year definitely starting in 26 is going to be awful the resources that we've been used to existing we thought it was bad it's going to get a lot worse right and so there's this way in which like i one thing that i would suggest is to encourage people to think about what resources do we have a lot of that are not financial to think about how they're strategizing about addressing these issues and then really broadly my advice for what to do is again like we've mentioned already across all of us so many different ways for people to start plugging in. I always think that, especially for arts organizations, the place to start is well what are the values of the art that you make. What is exciting to you about the artistic creative work that you do and how can you apply that and like how can you use that as the lens from which you say this is what would feel really motivating this is what would feel really exciting this is the creative experiment or our place in the larger ecosystem that we feel like we can you know kind of fit in right what is that theory of change where do you fit in to bettering the arts ecosystem and improving these conditions for all of us right um and then maybe the answer is open bookkeeping maybe the answer is you know scaling back maybe you know, like there could be so many different things right um but i think that values place uh and the looking at the art itself is really important but it also might reveal like oh actually we've been going for so long that there aren't any clear actual values that underlie the through line of the work that we do and that also might be a good place to start to say well what do we want to be here instead i think that that's a great place to start because i think that that is something that we possess right we possess the ability to be generative and to create and and articulate those values and we don't need anyone's support to do that, right? Like we we have that. That's a it's a great place to begin. Um, Bridine, I think you were going to jump in there for a minute. Yeah, and it's also on the topic of values, which is I think organizations do define their values, and donors, board members, at that level, they talk about those values and how they relate to the work. I think that another tangible thing we can be doing is. I mean, starting with just relationship building between the board members and donors and the people who are doing the work, and then ideally system thinking about that as well, but so that the folks who are, you know, choosing to support organizations based on those values actually understand what is happening operationally, because I think just connecting that is an early step. Like, I just think about when we buy our clothes and when you're, you know, when you know where your clothing is being made and what the labor conditions are, you make choices based off of that. And of course, theater production in the US is not at the same level of uh, inhumane labor conditions as clothing factories in Bangladesh. But um, on a smaller scale, that question of connecting, so I'm funding this because I believe that this organization has the values of inclusivity, creative risk taking but the, you know creating a space where we can do that these kinds of things and understanding what they're actually doing for, for the workers so i feel like there's just like at a very base level building relationships between those folks could be a step yeah and to that too about accountability right that like board members we had some great conversations with board members a lot of them don't know what's happening like they know what the budget looks like in a big way but they really there's a way in which they trust, for better or worse, the executive leadership of the theater to then use that budget in an equitable way. And we can have a whole different conversation about like how that should work, but but I think there's a question about like, what is the accountability between art makers or theater makers and as employers and boards? And like, what is the relationship between funders and the organizations they fund um, at a granular level, right? Like, I know that a lot of people would, would say like, oh my gosh, we want to be able to use our grant money the way we need to. That makes sense. And also, it's one thing to have a mission statement and another thing to live that mission statement at the most granular level of your budget, which I think all of us probably have experienced that disconnect in a variety of ways. Sure. 
I, you know, I think that the question of board accountability is really interesting because I think, at least in my experience, that often boils down to a board thinking about the fiscal health at sort of a high level and, and leadership feeling, rightfully so, pressure to deliver at that level to say like, I, it, this board is holding me accountable to a balanced budget, to solid cash flow, right? Like that's what what we're being pressured to do and therefore making question, making decisions based on that. Um, and I think, so I think there is some creative thinking to be done around how we we implement values at a granular level and are responsive to that type of accountability as well, because that does, that, you know, that's, that's a real thing, right? Like that, that does also factor in. Um, I wonder, you know, you've been giving such great um, advice around like sort of where to begin or what questions to ask. I wonder if anybody can share um, any success stories they've seen, whether you whether or not you're attaching names to these, but like any examples of this type of organization made this type of change and now has a better, more equitable system or is moving in that direction. Um, I feel, I find sometimes some, some of those examples are really useful and it, it could be also for your organization too, Daniel, like it could be examples from your own uh, work. Something I'll speak to very quickly um, is, excuse me, I really recommend people um, look up Open Collective Foundation's um, pay equity calculator. Unfortunately, Open Collective Foundation, who is uh, who was our fiscal sponsor, is closing this year. But there is this whole uh, practice that exists, and there are, you know, of course, out there consultants out there who can help you put it together. But essentially, it is a tool that defines a range of pay based on like lots of internal conversations, values, budgets, et cetera, et cetera, and then allows the staff of an organization to set their own pay from within a scale based on a variety of factors. I think something like that is absolutely mind blowing and amazing, like in the way that it shares power with people, in the way that it's able to take some really intense nuances of individual experience, history, social identity, organizational context, like budget, position, how responsibility is defined, and turning it into an actual system that allows people to have control over how much they are getting paid without necessarily having to like go into like weird, uncomfortable, unregulated, power based conversations with other people about like what enough for them actually is or what their pay should be. Um, so that's the only thing that I'll offer uh, is that pay equity calculator or that salary calculator from Open Collective Foundation. That's a great offering. Thank you. Anybody else examples? Sure. You would yeah, I'll, I'll um, uplift Collabora Action as an example. I'm on their board now, so full disclosure. Um, but they use the pay equity standards. And one of the parts of the pay equity standards is if you have union workers uh, in and non-union workers in the same area, so actors, for instance, you have to pay them the, the union rate so that uh, everybody's, you know, on that same level. Um, and Collabora Action recently did um, a film version, TV version of one of their uh, theatrical productions with NBC. And so had, you know, needed to use, say, actors and non-equity uh, non actors, and we're able to pay everybody the same rate. And the difference in the room, you know, when everybody knows that they are being um, equally valued, they're on the same footing, they are there for the same, you know, reasons, it, it really made a big difference. Um, you know, just the collaboration in the room. Um, and, and the work was, you know, I, it's hard to say what would have happened if it was paid on the, you know, traditional theater scale. Um, but they won an Emmy for the work. And so, um, I think there's a lot of, um, both financial and artistic benefits to valuing the people who are creating the work that, um, you know, when we have this kind of scarcity model mindset of not having enough and needing to maintain power dynamics, we're not necessarily thinking of the benefits that come from having a workforce that is on the same footing, you know, able to speak up when they see something or have an idea or need extra support. Um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, positive things and risk management things that come from pay equity that I think are really important for people to consider in the um, in the grand scheme of things and not just the difficult aspects. 
Um, you will not be surprised to hear me say that, you know, I think uh, workers working together in collective is in fact the most powerful way to solve the pay equity problem. Um, this is why we have the National Labor Relations Act. Um, this is like the thing that our government finally granted us in 1935 and that we shall be using. But um, we, I mean, we talked to a lot of organizations that have been done, ex have done excellent work. And one of the projects that I think is worth, or that we think is worth lifting up is um, a group of uh, des designers working as assistants off Broadway spent, um, so just a tiny backstory, um, United Scenic Artists organized our, our first collectively bargained a contract with the Off-Broadway League in 2017. That contract covered designers working off-Broadway, but not assistants. In the time between 2017 and the second negotiation in 2021, a group of folks working as assistants um, really worked together to organize all of the folks, basically, who had worked as assistants in those theaters. Um, and to organize the designers working under the contract to support the inclusion of assistance in the new contract. So we went into that negotiation with one big ask. We achieved that big ask. It is not perfect, but it is the first contract in the history of United Scenic Artists, which is more than 125 years old, that includes minimum wage language for designers working in live performance. Um, it's a huge plus. And that is a grassroots effort started by a mix of union members and non-union members, who are now all members, um, uh, working with the union and then with the employers to make that happen. I don't know, Brie, if you wanna add to that. But... No, I mean, I think I will add to that one, but one other organization I'd like to highlight is um, in terms of thinking about the unpaid internships and moving toward paid internships, I think that collaborative models are really important and Black Theatre United is one of the organizations that is running a really strong collaborative model for their internship program where they have an internship program collaborating with six different marketing agencies where they place the interns, they offer professional development and networking programs and I hope that in, as we think about professional training in the in the pay equity conversation, we start to see more folks working together in these ways. Um, and I think that Black Theatre United is doing a good job of demonstrating ways that we can do that, um, where it's supporting the inter the students, the workers, the these com agencies, and also furthering furthering the field with us all working together. Great. Really quick too, I guess just the, the last thing that I will offer around all of this is with all of these practices, right? And I'm loving hearing like cooperation, collaboration, working together, right? Solidarity, right? Being lifted up over and over again is also just like wanting to name and recognize that like, even if some of these practices within this context might feel new to folks who are listening or even to some of us, right? that we're pulling on long legacies and traditions ranging back from like indigenous knowledge to like people on the block, like sharing a babysitter or taking care of each other's kids, right? Like I think another way to enter into this conversation is like when money's hard in my house, when I need support on my block, who do I turn to and what is it, what is it that I ask of them, right? And how do we build, like, how do we look at the rest, again, like applying our creativity, how do we look at the rest of our lives and how we address these same issues that we face in our personal lives? And how do we think about applying some of those basic ideas, values, practices to our workplaces, right? Not in a we're all family kind of way, right? Not that, right? With like still a certain amount of like workplace policy and protection around it, right? But like thinking about that as a starting point if it feels inaccessible or feels overwhelming. That's great. Thank you. So as we begin to wrap up our conversation, I, I sort of want to end with your thoughts about dreaming for the future. What, you know, what, what does a more equitable future look like for you? What is your vision for that? So uh, put that in your brain and and percolate on it. But while, while you percolate, I also want to just offer up an opportunity. Is there something that you wanted to surface in this conversation that we haven't touched on, that I haven't asked about, or we haven't sort of found our way to, um, because you have, you know, deep knowledge around these things. And is there something that you want to make sure that we bring into this space that we haven't yet had the opportunity to? I feel like we've a little bit said it, but I do want to just name that when we're having the pay equity conversation, as Elsa said at the very beginning, this is a conversation that disproportionately affects 
folks working specifically in the gendered crafts, um, which include costume design and costume crafts. It also includes scenic painting, which is a primarily female craft. Um, and historically, uh, then of course, disproportionately affects um, people on the femme end of the spectrum who are doing that work, and then disproportionately more so folks of color and um, with a variety of other identities. And that like, a lot of times the people making the decisions don't want to talk about that. And that um, most favored nations is not the answer. Most favored nations, for those of you who don't know, is the idea that everyone gets paid the same thing without an acknowledgement of what how the work is different. And for example, when you pay all the designers on a show the same fee, I can just say as a lighting designer, I'm often hired last. I go to fewer meetings. I have fewer shop visits. My workflow is shorter. And so for me to make the same amount of money as a costume designer, who in a lot of cases is expected to not only create the costume design, but also generate the objects, isn't equity actually equitable. Just because the number is the same doesn't mean that, the, that that's an equitable system. And so I just want to like call back to the gender inequities there, but also to the like ways in which we think there's an easy band-aid that is not and isn't potentially causing more harm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just um, lift up the, the thing that I think has been underlying a lot of what I'm saying, but feels really important to bring out, which is that the systems that we are operating in want us to be turned against one another. It's really easy to be mad at your boss, the person that's hiring you to be mad at funders, right, et cetera, et cetera. And that's like real, those feelings are real. And, right, we are actually more powerful when all of us reckon with all of the complexities, the nuances, the things that we're feeling and come together, right? Turn that anger against the system, right? Have empathy and understanding and sympathy for one another, engage in meaningful conversations and systems change around that power, right? But like, we gotta see each other as allies in this process. And that can be so incredibly hard to do. It really takes time, it takes so much soft especially for the people who ultimately have the least amount of power in these processes right but like just inviting that like solidarity means like we all have to be in this together no one is left behind i'll jump in on in thinking about systems and policies i think just one other sort of specific thing we haven't talked about is and tangible things that pe folks can do is um how job agreements are communicated. So one thing that Natalie and I spoke with workers about is how often they have taken jobs without knowing the pay and how often they've begun work without having contracts. And when we now are beginning to have conversations with people, particularly outside of the field, that's some of the data that folks are really shocked to hear that those of us who do this are not as <laughs> surprised by. Um, but it one thing that really stuck with me, it was 67% of workers sometimes often or always have begun their work in production without a contract and without knowing the pay, those numbers are high. So I think that's a tangible part of the process that we haven't focused on here, but that organizations and folks who hire, which also includes, you know, designers hiring assistants, crew chiefs hiring their crews. Like there's a lot of people with hiring power who can we who can check these things off the list do they have a contract before they begin do they know what they're being paid it it's so important to like look at those stories that the industry tells itself and that we tell each other knowingly or unknowingly that like support the system because you know it's like we have all of these practices like that that are normalized we have low pay that's normalized unpaid internships being the entry to the industry having to have a college degree being the entry um and you know i think natalie you brought up like the the passion pay kind of idea that like we take the low pay because we have job satisfaction like that's also a story there was a really great study out of museums moving forward um you know museum sector uh study that was looking at museum workers and their job satisfaction compared to us workers overall it just came out this fall and you know uh, museum workers are less satisfied by a pretty significant percent than, you know, U.S. workers overall. And so these are all stories that the system like propagates and tells and that we tell ourselves so that we have like all these sunk costs and we can feel better about like 
the low rates that we've allowed ourselves to work for and the exploitation we've like allowed on ourselves and then probably passed along to other folks. Um, and so like taking in those things and like hearing the story uh, when it's told to you and, and hearing the story before you tell it to somebody else is really important to making all this change. And I think the guilt and shame that folks feel for not wanting to do it or for not being able to do it, right? That there's like a silencing, people have been told this is how you do it. I, I was talking to a human who is graduating from grad school right now. Like they just had a faux interview at a event that I shall remain nameless. And um, four different prof professionals told this student that they should expect to um, like work their way up and pay their dues. And it was gonna be hard at the beginning and they should work for free and it's okay. And I was like, it is 2024. Stop telling those stories, you know, and I think that story is a lot like, I mean, I worked for free at the beginning of my career and I don't want anyone to have to do that in the same way that I have graduate school debt and I don't want anyone else to have it. Right. And I think that um, those stories, as Elsa is saying, are really, they're so strong and so loud that especially for folks who are at the beginning of their careers who are most vulnerable in these situations. Like how do they even speak up against a story that is being screamed at them from multiple directions? And and also, you know, I think David, you mentioned like the privilege that allows, and I, I will say for me and, you know, Natalie and Breedine, you said it beautifully in your book, you know, like the privilege that I have to allow me to like speak about these things and be an activist and an advocate and, you know, have people listen to me in a way that, um, you know, they listen to me. Um, and there's a lot of privilege in that, but also like there's a lot of personal toll in that. I do not work as a costume designer anymore. People do not hire me, you know, because uh, I brought things up. Uh, in negotiations or with my team members or, you know, these sorts of things. And so um, it is, you know, hard work personally, but then also outwardly. And uh, we all need to like use the little bits of privilege or the lots of bits of privilege that we have um, and then support other people when they're doing it too. Okay. All right. So this has been an incredible conversation. And as we begin to close it, I want to just ask, um, if what is your vision for a more equitable and sustainable future for our field? And I think, um, I, you know, I'm going to take my cue from Daniel here to say, like, this might be generational shift. I understand that what I'm asking you to speak to right now is not something that might happen in the next 10 years. But but what does that vision look like? How How do you see us, you know, in the future, if we can make these iterative steps to get there? Bree wrote us a list. Can I read our list? Oh, sure. I mean, we also wrote a book, so we wrote the list a lot of times. The list um, is from the book. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so uh, we define an accessible, inclusive, and sustainable theater production ecosystem as a field in which every person has access to educational opportunities that lead to and enha enhance careers in production. We have just hiring practices that address the varying needs of workers. Work is paid equitably. Production operations, including budgets and schedules, are human-centered. Labor and safety standards include all aspects of physical and emotional health and are taught and followed. And career paths in production are sustainable and healthy. I can speak. Do you want me to keep going? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else anyone would like to add? That's our um, <laughs> um, I will add that um, we are the, um, you know, like as an industry, we bemoan this like living in a society that doesn't value arts, but then we are at like the front edge of being able to actively value art and demonstrate that for the rest of our society and culture. And that's really important. And so I think that as we do that better, society will uh, catch up and take, you know, pace with us. Um, and I also think, you know, I, I definitely understand and respect the generational view, but also we could fix this in like one year if we actually wanted. And I've seen organizations just decide to switch systems and start paying equitably and end unpaid internships in one budget cycle. And they did it. And that's what they're going for right now. 
And we could do that if we wanted to as an industry, as individual companies, as individual workers, and it's a choice not to. And, you know, that's a fine choice if you if you feel like that's better for you, but you have to own that. Um, and I just, this is not really vision for the future, but I want to just make sure people know that you do not need more money to do any of this work. All of this work is a, you know, net zero. And we know that because you look at the big theaters in Chicago or wherever you are located, and those big theaters are not doing pay equity well. They have massive gender pay gaps. They have departmental pay gaps, racial pay gaps. Um, and so putting more money into an inequitable system is not the answer. And we see a lot of small companies doing really important, great work, groundbreaking work in pay equity. Um, so stop using that as an excuse. Thank you. I'll offer mine real quick. Mine's very big, very broad. Universal basic income, education, housing, food, and healthcare for all, uh, and an end to an economy that relies on war and genocide in favor of an economy that puts people over profit. That's my vision. Thank you. Everyone, this has been um, an incredible conversation and um, the be hopefully the beginning of one for some folks viewing. I will uh, quick plug, this is part of a three-part series that Art New York is hosting. Part two is a panel conversation at our Spring Summit um, in June. The Spring Summit is June 4th and 5th. That conversation will also be live streamed on HowlRound, um, so please uh, check it out. Um, the third part of, the, of this series is a roundtable for Art New York members uh, to come together and brainstorm solutions as a community um, that will not be live streamed on HowlRound, but do check out the second the second part, which will. Um, that's my plug. Now I offer it to you folks. What do you want to share um, with folks watching about where they can go next, what they should check out um, to continue thinking about this topic? I'll offer from obvious agency two things. Um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about democratic management, solidarity economy practices, there's two options for you. Um, first is that we are actually going to be at our first ever TCG this year. We're going to be running a three hour introduction 101 workshop on uh, democratic management and uh, arts and culture workplaces focusing on theater. So uh, check us out there. We would love to see you. Um, or if you're not going to be at TCG, or can't make that session, we also offer free 30 minute intakes and consultations. Uh, and you can find, you can reach out to us through our website, uh, which will be linked on HowlRound. Excellent. Thank you. I'll say you go next. <laughs> um, you can find out more about On Our Team at onourteam.org and you can download the pay equity standards on our website. It's free to access and use, use part of it, use all of it. Uh, reach out if you have questions. We're always happy to talk. Great, thank you. Uh, you can buy our book um, any, maybe anywhere, certainly on the internet. Um, uh, production Labor Book uh, is our website. Oh, dot org, dot org, right? Dot org, dot com. com. Oh my God, production labor book dot com, um, uh, which has links to buy it and all that stuff. And for anybody who's watching, in New York, we're doing two book events, um, May 21st and 22nd, um, while Berdeen is in the US and not in Abu Dhabi. And then for anybody who might be in Philadelphia, we're doing events on May 20th and 24th. Um, and that information is all on the website. And we'd love to talk to any of you there. Fabulous. All right, thank you all so much. This has been an incredible conversation. Thanks to those watching. Um, I hope this generates at the beginning of something for you. If if uh, you haven't been thinking about this already, um, maybe this is the sign. So um, reach out to Art New York. If we can be of support, um, you can reach me at dshane, D-S-H-A-N-E, at art-newyork.org. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>